copy of God's Word, I would invite you to open to the book of Ephesians. I almost said Matthew. That would be weird. That's right. This morning we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5. We'll be looking down uh, through verses 15 through uh, 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. Now, if you were with us last week, we talked about walking in love and walking as light in this world. Specifically, we talked about avoiding ungodliness, that we are to live as, as kingdom citizens, as those who have been made new creations in Christ Jesus. And this week, we're going to be continuing this looking at the manner of life that is, that is befitting of one who is a citizen of the kingdom of God. And before we dive in, I want to ask you a question, and that is, would you say from the outset that your life is one that is characterized by submission to the Holy Spirit and making the most of each day? Now, these two things, they seem like they are sort of far apart in our minds. How can you seize the day and then still be walking and filled with the Holy Spirit? But I think that as we, as we walk through this, you'll see that these things actually, they go hand in hand. And I think... That for most of us, probably, we haven't given much, much thought about it. In fact, if we're honest about it, most of us spend the majority of our days just merely existing. We are sort of passively living each day until the weekend comes and we can enjoy our days off. So we are the type of person maybe that whenever we are on vacation, we say that we live each day to the fullest or that we seize every opportunity to do things or if we are off on the weekend, we seize every opportunity to do things. Or maybe those specific days when you have a goal or a deadline in mind and you say, yes, in that day, I was seeking to fill that day with the most quality things that I could. But I wonder, don't you kind of view, if you think about it honestly, just existing until the weekend or existing until the next thing happens, don't you think that seems sort of like a waste of time? I mean, if you're honest with yourself, don't. Don't you think God has placed you on the earth for so much more than to merely just exist? <clears throat> Furthermore, merely existing passively, living each day is no way to grow in godliness and wisdom, as we'll see in a moment. And we are kingdom citizens, beloved. We are new creations in Christ. We are those who know the truth and truth, and we exist for the glory of God. We should be the ones who are most prone to live each day. I mean, after all, doesn't Ephesians 2 tell us that we were those who were dead? And now we are alive. And so I want us to read this passage this morning. And I don't just want us to sort of gloss over it on the way to something else. I want us to, to spend a focused time this morning thinking about, reflecting on how we live our lives. What are the avenues? What are the, all the goals, the aims? What are we pursuing? How are we living on Tuesday or on Monday, how are we doing these things in our lives? And then what is the dominant influence in our life? And so let's read Ephesians chapter 5 and we'll look at verses 15 through 21 this morning. We'll look at it in just two points, so two points this morning. God's Word says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray this morning and ask God's blessing and His assistance on His Word. Our Father in Heaven, Lord, we come to You this morning with our Bibles open. And Father, we pray that through the study of Your Word that You would show us the pathway of wisdom, that You would show us the pathway of holiness. Father, we know that without the working of Your Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds, Lord, these pages are just... Words on a page, rather. And Father, we know that your Holy Spirit is the only means by which these things can be applied to our lives. As the Holy Spirit takes and applies these truths deeply into our hearts and then affects our lives by them. Father, we thank you for everything that we've learned up until this point. 
And Father, we pray that you would continue to teach us, continue to grow us. God, we pray that ultimately, as we leave out of this place in an hour or so, God, we would be different than when we came in. Father, I know that so many of my brothers and sisters in here would have brought so many things in with them. Distractions. Various things from the outside world that would rob our attention and our affection from you this morning. And Father, we pray that you would put those things out of our minds. Father, allow us to be able to focus with a single-minded focus this morning on what we're studying, what we're learning. Father, we thank you in advance for all that you're going to do in and through us through this morning's service. Lord, we offer it to you as an offering to you. We pray that you are pleased with it. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first thing that I want us to see, the first broad category, is that the Apostle Paul tells us to look carefully how we live our life. Look carefully how we live our life. In verse 15, he begins and says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And so he says, look carefully then. And since he phrases it that way, we have to look back at everything he has just said. Remember, he told us that we are to be imitators of God. And then he told us all of the various things in our lives, all of these traits that should no longer be in existence for us. Sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness. There shouldn't be any filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking. These are out of place. And that these things won't inhabit the kingdom of God. Indeed, people whose lives are reflective of these things, the characteristics of their lives or the overarching principle of their lives as the sexually immoral, the idolatry. These are the type of people that don't inhabit the kingdom of God. And we're told, in fact, to separate ourselves from them. In fact, he tells us not to join in with them. He tells us rather to walk in light so that the light of Christ might shine through us. So they would see our light and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. And here we have, as he continues that thought, he sort of summarizes it here at the bottom of this before he transitioned into this idea of submission between wives and husbands, and husbands and wives and children, and bond servants, so on and so forth. He summarized everything, and he states it as, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. And we see from the outset that he tells us to look carefully to, or pay attention to, how you are living your life. Pay attention. Here he's commanding us to do a self-evaluation of the way that we are living each day. And the reason for this is because in the everyday grind of life, we are prone to fall into ruts or habits without even realizing it, to get lost in the monotony and not pay much attention at all to how we're living at Tuesday on 9.15 or Thursday at 7 o'clock. But I would remind you, beloved, that you are children of God. You are people who are alive to God. You are kingdom citizens. You are new creations in Christ Jesus, not just on Sunday. Not just on the hour that we spend worshiping together on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, or perhaps for the especially pious on Wednesday afternoons. Listen, the reality of you being a new creation in Christ, a third humanity as you were, someone who has citizens with all of the citizens of the kingdom of God, someone whose life is characterized by love of God and holiness in life, that is something that permeates your whole life. Monday through Sunday, or Sunday through Saturday, I guess would be more appropriate. The way that we live our lives, it matters. And so the Apostle Paul begins under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in this, or rather summarizes what came. He tells us, look carefully then how you walk. Every day of your life, do a self-evaluation. Whenever you wake up in the morning, make it to be something that is the, the manner or the goal or the, the end goal of your life is to, is to walk with God. And he tells us ways that we are to walk. He says, look carefully, but walk as those who are not as unwise, but as wise. The word that he uses there, unwise and wise, is the word from which we get philosophy from. Sophie in the Greek. Look as someone, walk as someone who has wisdom. Not like someone who has no wisdom. And remember, in the Bible, wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. In other words, he says, live your life like God exists. Live your life in the fear of the Lord. Make decisions based on the reality that you belong to God. 
The book of Proverbs tells us the beginning of all knowledge is the fear of the Lord. The beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. You see, without understanding that we belong to God, that God exists, we are merely grasping at, reaching out for things that the world would deem as wisdom. And beloved, the things the world deems as wise are not the things that God deems as wise. In fact, if you are trying to allow the culture or the world to dictate what it means to walk as someone who is walking in wisdom, then you are going to have an ever-changing current of shifting sands. Can you see over the past decade or so the way that wisdom has changed even in America, even in Sperger? The way that the people are living their lives, the way the culture says is wise. Haven't you seen how much, how far, how different that is? And I don't even mean just watching Andy Griffith and seeing the wisdom of that day and age. I'm talking about 15 years ago or whenever I was in high school, two years ago. No, that's not true. <laughs> but haven't you seen, as you've been growing up, maybe now you have children, you have grandchildren, and you're seeing, you're looking and you're saying, the, what, what the world values, what the world calls wise today is so much different than whenever I was a child. That's why he tells us, don't walk that way. Don't walk as unwise, but as wise. You see, all of the collective wisdom of the world would be deemed as, all, as, as unwise here, or asophie. It was to be something that is not wisdom. It is something that is foolish to God. Remember, the fool is the one, not who is not learning. The fool is not, is the one, is not the one who is uneducated. The fool is the one who says in his heart, there is no God. So he tells us here to walk not as the unwise, but as the wise. In other words, live your life like God actually exists. <clears throat> Don't live as a functional atheist. That he says, make the best use of time. Now this is a little bit of a difficult passage or a bit difficult phrase to translate. This could be translated, redeem the time. In fact, the word that he uses there is a word that would commonly be used of someone going out and purchasing something, something back. And the word that he uses there for time, it's a word that is different than the normal word for time. It can mean era or epoch. It's the idea here of redeeming the time or redeeming the era or the season that you're living in. And he tells us because the days are evil. Now this is a, a picture here of Paul's understanding of eschatology. It means end time things. There is a drastic separation in Paul's mind between the era or the epoch that we're living in now and the era of Christ's return. You see, one day Christ will return and he will make all things right. All injustices will be made right. All of the wrongs of the world will be turned over and made right. Everything that is sinful and unholy and unclean will be done away with. And we will dwell forever in a kingdom of perfect righteousness. But until that time, beloved, the days are evil. These days, this day, this era that we're living in, the year that we're living in, this time frame, these things are evil. You see, these things are not neutral. We have a very real enemy who roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We are living in a world that is at enmity with God. Let me say that again. We are living in a world that is at enmity with God. And our fallen flesh still desires the things that this world can provide. Therefore, we have to be intentional about the way we're living each moment and each day. He tells us, make the best use of time, because the days are evil. I think maybe the best way to grasp this is for you to imagine yourself in a rowboat in a river. We have many rivers around us, and perhaps you've been out in a piro or some sort of flat bottom boat, a canoe or a kayak nowadays. And so you're sitting in a rowboat in a river, and the river is the natural flow of this world that is lost and headed for destruction. Do you know how you end up at the wrong end of that? You just don't do anything. You just sit still. See, the way that you end up going in the wrong direction is simply just to do nothing. Amen. This is why Paul tells us here, make the best use of time because the days are evil. The way that you end up in the wrong place is do nothing. No one has ever grown in holiness by simply existing each day. It takes intentionality. No one ever has made a kingdom impact by simply going with the flow. 
You look at people who have made the most impact on the world for the kingdom of God. It's those who are willing to live each day intentionally. Someone asked George Whitfield, they said, what would you do if you knew today was the last day? You know what he did? He opened up his daily printer and read what he was going to do the next day. He lived each life, I mean each day like today could be the day Christ returns. He lived each day like today could be the day that he died and that he was to stand before the presence of a holy God. You see, we're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised today. We're not even promised for this next hour. And what should we do? Well, as we were studying through Matthew, every time Jesus told his disciples that his return is imminent, he tells them, so then be busy doing things, intentionally waking up each day. You know, you ought to wake up each day and you ought to say, Lord, today is your day. I'm going to walk with you. Help me to make a kingdom impact today. Live each day. Make the best use of time. And then he tells us, there, don't, don't, throw, don't be foolish. Don't, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. This is something that we, we saw last week as well, as we understand what the, the will of God is, right? Verse 10, it says, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. He's saying it in a different way, but saying the same thing. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, any time that we hear that phrase, the will of the Lord, we, we mystify it. And we turn it into something that it's not, right? We say, well, what he means is that what we need to do is we need to try to figure out the hidden, unrevealed will of God, the secret things, right? That's what we all, always think about whenever we hear, you need to understand what the will of the Lord is. You immediately think, well, that means what am I going to do whenever I, I grow up? Or what is that well, I'm going to do for my occupation? Or that specific person that I'm going to marry? That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the unrevealed secret will of the Lord that no one can possibly know or understand. He means taking the revealed will of God, the Word of God, and applying it to every situation in your life. Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought yourself to yourself in a particular scenario or decision, what does the Bible have to say about what I'm doing? I mean, be honest with yourself. Have you ever paused as you're, as you're going through your work day and said, what does the Bible have to say about what I'm doing? Or when you're structuring your finances, or whenever you're structuring your family life, or the way that your calendar is going to play itself out. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, I mean physically asked yourself, what does the Bible have to say? You know, we as Christians, we believe, at least we as conservative evangelical Christians, we believe that this is the Word of God. In fact, we believe that every single word in here is inspired by the Word of God in the original language, so, so far as we can get to the originals. Amen. We believe it is God's Word, breathed out, right? The Abnustos, breathed out by God, which is profitable for us in all areas, all spheres of our lives. But we make financial decisions. Do we consult what the will of God is? When we make decisions for our family, how we're going to spend our Sundays. <laughs> Do we consult the Word of God to see what He has to say about it? What about the type of person that we're going to spend the rest of our life with? Or the type of area or service we can go into? Or the type of entertainment we value? Or the things that we put on a pedestal? Have you ever stopped and actually asked yourself, what does the Bible have to say about these things? Beloved, we have to. We absolutely have to. The fact is, the Bible is full of wisdom. And, and while it may not speak directly to each and every situation that you are facing, it does provide for us the pathway or principles by which we can live our lives. And what I mean by that is, you may not look in here and it says, go work at Exxon, but not Conoco, right? We, we don't see that in there, but there are wisdom principles. There are principles or pathways that God has laid for us so that we can make godly decisions. Furthermore, when it comes to discerning God's will, God's not deaf. He hears our prayers, does He not? Amen. Ask God. Ask God to provide wisdom for every situation. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to live a life. There's two seemingly decent or terrible decisions, whatever the case may be. 
Ask the Lord what He wants you to do. Listen, God desires for you to walk wisely. He's telling you right here, through the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not to be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. God desires you to walk wisely. He desires for you to do His will. He's not going to hide it from you. He's not going to tell you, walk according to my will. I want you to walk according to my way. And then you say, well, what is your way? And he says, I'm not telling you. And then a boo-boo. <laughs> God would never do that to his children. You would never do that to your children. Do you think God is going to withhold from you, his child, what you need to live according to his word? He who sent his son to die for us, do you think he's not going to give us all things? It's as plain as the nose on my face. James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. That means he doesn't do it in a begrudging way, and it will be given to him. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. He'll give it to you. Not begrudgingly. Not by saying, okay, but that's strike three. He'll give it to you. Joyfully, happily, like you give your wisdom to your children. God will give it to you. Don't be foolish. Understand what the will of God is. Take everything you know about God's word. Apply it to every situation of your life. If you are living according to the word of God, you won't be walking out of the will of God, in other words. So would you say, would you say that, that in your life you are seizing each day? You are waking up each day and saying, how can I make an impact for the kingdom of God today in this culture? That's what it means to make the best use of time. Would you say that's true of you? Are you doing your best to walk carefully to make the best use of time to apply the word of God to each and every situation in your life? If the answer to that is no this morning, why don't you start today? You say, well, I haven't been doing that. I haven't been doing that. I haven't ever done that. Today's a new day. There's nothing but air and opportunity. This is a command from God. You know what the, what the thing to do is with commands from God? Do them. Do it. Don't say, well, I haven't done it in the past. You know, and I've already sinned in this way for the last 25 years. I probably should just continue to live in sin then. Probably not. How about stopping and doing it? Today, when you're faced with a decision, ask yourself, what does God's word have to say about this? What do I think God's will is? Well, it seems like there are two good options here according to biblical principles. What's step two? Ask God. The second thing that we see here is that we are to be filled with the Spirit. And it's all. I killed it. This is what happens to me. I just kill things like this. All right. So he begins here in verse 18. He says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Paul begins with a negative command for Christians. Don't get drunk. Let me say that again, because we try to mystify it, we get confused about it. We're going to talk about some of these nuances in just a second. Let me say it plainly to you. Don't get drunk. It's that simple. Don't get drunk. And he's talking about all of us. He's not just talking to a select few like, oh yeah, well you and Brother Dustin and Brother John don't get drunk, we're going to get drunk. No. <laughs> don't get drunk. He's not talking to just your pastors or your leaders or your deacons. He's not talking even into, to an individual here. He means corporately. All of us, as a church, without exception. Don't get drunk. Don't do it. And some see in this a reference to the pagan practices of worship in the day, which were prevalent in Ephesus and various places in that society where they get drunk. They would get really drunk, so drunk, in fact, that they would sort of lose themselves so that way they could make contact with the divine, which, of course, this practice ended in all manner of sinful behavior. And that's a possibility. I think it's possible he is referencing that, but I don't think he's being that specific. In other words, I don't think he's saying... Don't get drunk when you come to church. Which, by the way, don't get drunk when you come to church. But I think he means here your whole entire life, right? I don't think he just has in 
time when you come together to worship God. I think what he's saying here, and I think it's very clear, that the manner of life, right, look carefully then how you walk, includes the command to not be drunk. Not getting drunk. Notice he says here, it is debauchery. Most people read that. Do not get drunk with wine, for that leads to debauchery. And they think, well, as long as I don't do anything that leads to debauchery, then he's not talking to me. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. The act of drunkenness itself is the sinful behavior. And a child of God should never be under the influence of anything other than the Holy Spirit. And some ask, well, can I drink it all then? And I would simply ask, why? I mean, let's be honest about this. We're applying godly wisdom, right? This is what we do. We do see in Scripture sometimes where we see that wine is a gift from God, right? Or we see in the New Testament where people were drinking wine. And yes, they mixed it with water so that way they wouldn't become drunk. They were drinking things that wouldn't make them sick. And yes, we see that Timothy is told to take a little bit of wine for his stomach. So some say, well, then I can just drink, right? And I would just simply ask you, why would you want to? I mean, be honest. Because once you get past all of these gray areas, you start getting into the why question. That starts to really deal with the heart of the matter. And I want to ask you, can you not enjoy the life God has given you without building your senses or ruining your ability to make decisions and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Is that what it is? You can't enjoy this life without drinking? You can't enjoy what God has given you without drinking something that ruins your ability to make decisions? Or completely overturns the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Is that what you're saying? Because if that's what you're saying, that's sinful. And I'm not sure the Bible condemns all alcohol at all times. But I want us to consider, is drinking wise? Is it wise for you to drink at all? I would start with Exhibit A. I've never in my whole life, I grew up as a welder in Buna. Not everybody in Buna is alcohol. Don't think that. I know how many people are about Buna. <laughs> but in all my years of spending time around people that drink, I have never seen anyone become more godly or grow in holiness by drinking alcohol. Never once. I have never once seen somebody drunk that is acting more like Jesus. <laughs> Ever. I have personally witnessed the way alcohol ruins families and lives. Witnessed it time and time again. I witnessed it in my secular profession. I watched as families were destroyed by alcohol. I watched as alcohol led to drugs, drugs led to divorce, and all manner of problems. Alcohol and drugs led to jail time. I've watched it time and time and time again. I watched it as a welder in my, my past profession, and I've seen it ruin families as a pastor. I've counseled people in my time as a pastor working and for the church. I have personally watched family after family be ruined by alcohol. Even if it's not ruining your life, I want to ask you, are you not inadvertently supporting an industry that ruins the lives of others? Be honest with yourself. If you know people are becoming alcoholics and they, they are... And by the way, that, this counts for anything, by the way, that, that brings you under the influence of it. Not just alcohol. Anything in your life that brings you under the influence of it. Even if it's not ruining your life. Say you're a person and you, and you are that person that can drink just a little bit of wine with your supper or you can drink just a, a few beers when you get home and nothing and all this and you say, well, that's fine, it's not simple. Maybe not, but listen. Are you not inadvertently then supporting an industry that ruins the lives of others? Aren't you giving money to the same monster that's destroying families across our nation? And do you think it's loving your neighbor in the way Christ intended to do that? If you know something's killing your neighbor, some industry, and you're funneling your dollars into it every day or every week or every month, and it's destroying your neighbor's life, do you think that's loving? And this one, and this is something I want you to think about if you're a, a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle. What you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. 
Now, there will be children who will break the cycle. And shame on you if they have to break the cycle of your behavior to be able to follow Christ. But what you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. You say, I don't believe that. Oh, yeah? Look when you were kids. Look at the culture today. What happened? You know, these churches used to be full of people. Full of them. That's why you walk into just about any rural church in America today and you'll see many, many empty pews. Do you know why there's so many pews in here? Because there used to be bottoms to fill them. Do you know what happened? Parents started saying church is not a priority. We'll go once a month. We'll send our tithe, but we won't go. And if we miss, that's okay. So we started raising up children like that. And then what happened to those children? Well, it really wasn't a priority to their parents, but they went because of the culture. Well, now the culture shifted, and they don't come at all. What happened? What you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. Do you know that the majority of the people in my life, people I went to school with, people that I still know and care about that are alcoholics, do you know their parents drank? You can't get around it. What you allow in your home, what you do in moderation, your, your children will do in excess. They'll do it. Finally, if you cause someone to stumble, you're sinning. I don't care what excuse you make. They should turn their head. They shouldn't be worried about what I'm doing right. I don't care anything about that. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. If someone watches you, your behavior causes someone to stumble. You are walking in sin. You are sinning. So then he moves on from there, from getting drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, to being filled with the Spirit. Now on the surface here, all of these various things, addressing one another in psalms, spinning hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord, giving thanks to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another, these all seem like different commandments, or at least different things that we should be doing. But the fact is, all of these things are tied grammatically back to the idea of being filled with the Spirit. And this is the positive. He gave you the negative. Now he's giving you the positive. This is the alternative. Excuse me. And I think that what he's doing here, he's holding up this as the infinitely preferable choice. In other words, if you had the opportunity to be filled with, with something else that influences you, whether it be drugs, alcohol, or whatever the case may be for you, if you had the opportunity to be filled with that, or you had the opportunity to be filled with the Spirit of God, this is the infinitely more preferable choice. You see, God's not telling you this so it'll ruin your life, right? I'm not telling you to abstain from anything that influences you in a bad way so that way you'll have no fun in your life, so that way you'll have no enjoyment or joy in your life. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is get rid of this garbage so the Holy Spirit will work in your life. Get rid of this so that. Get rid of the drunkenness. The Holy Spirit will fill you. you. See, Don't be filled with something else that influences you. Be filled with the Spirit of God to influence you. You see, this is the infinitely more preferable choice. How many alcoholics do you know that are joyful? I know zero. How many Christians do you know that are walking with God that are filled with joy? You see, the proof is in the pudding here. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the positive. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea about this because we have brothers and sisters that I care very much about in the kingdom of God that get totally confused on this point. Paul is not talking about being baptized in the Spirit or finally and fully receiving the Holy Spirit once for all. You see, that turns the church into the haves and the have-nots. And what Jesus is telling us, what we've been learning through Ephesians, is that Christ died so that everyone would be on the same footing. So that everyone would be filled with the Spirit. So that everyone would be baptized by God into the body of Christ. In other words, the, the foot at the cross, or the, the land at the cross, is level there. I just want to read you a couple of passages. You can make note of them. You can go back and study them for yourself. For those who would say that what he's talking about here is finally being baptized in the Spirit, or finally receiving the Holy Spirit... Here's just a few. You can go a lot of places. Romans 8, 9. Paul says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Jesus. If you are not indwelt by the Spirit of God, you don't belong to Christ. 
So then those that I'm talking about would naturally say, okay, but we're not talking about receiving the Spirit at your initial salvation. We're talking about baptism in the Spirit, which leads to various other things. 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jew, Greek, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. Let me read that again. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, all were made to drink of one spirit. So then the natural thing that comes after that, yea, they will say, yes, but what we're talking about is supernatural empowerment of the spirit. We're calling it something else. Well, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, the same chapter. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. And just in case we didn't get it the first time, he says, to each, that means to everybody, everybody that belongs to Christ, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Or Ephesians 1.13, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So we're not commanded to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. This happens at our new birth. What we are commanded here to do is allow the Holy Spirit to continually fill us. This is something that is different. This is something that is subsequent. This is something that is continual. And the, the way that it is phrased means a continual thing. Something we are to, to continually allow to happen. It's passive. We don't fill ourselves with the Spirit. He fills us. This is something that is passively received by us. And this is something that is continuous. And I think it probably lies behind the confusion of those who get this baptism and feeling mixed up. If you wanted to put it a different way, I, I quoted from some commentators here. One of them says, Baptism of the Spirit means that I belong to Christ's body. Filling of the Spirit means that my body belongs to Christ. Or another way, Each Christian has all the Spirit, but the command here is to have, or is to allow the Spirit to have all of them. The wise walk, then, is one that is characterized by the Holy Spirit's control. So we are commanded to allow the Holy Spirit to continually fill us or to continually have complete control of our life. The parallel passage is the one that Brother Dustin read this morning, which ends by saying, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So if we take what we've already learned from Ephesians, and we take what we know from Colossians, we see that when we are filled with the Spirit, we are in fact filled with Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 23. Verse 22 he says, And he put all things under his feet, gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Chapter 4 and verse 10, speaking of Christ, He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that He might fill all things. 4.13 Until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. To be filled with the Spirit, we are also filled with the Father. In chapter 3 verse 19, in verse 18 it says, May have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We are filled with the Spirit. In chapter 5, verse 18, this is the means by which we are filled with all of these other things. And then in Colossians, we are filled with God's Word. So then what are the characteristics of someone? This is what he's talking about as he begins to have this list. What are the characteristics of someone who is continually being filled with the Spirit or who is allowing themselves to continually be under the influence of the Holy Spirit? What does it look like? Well, the first thing he says is addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sounds rather boring, doesn't it? But it's not. What would you expect? Someone that's filled with the Spirit can walk into Texas children and raise the dead. Been watching too much TVN. 
Be filled with the Spirit. What does it look like? It looks like someone whose heart is so filled with worship that it overflows in the way that we talk to one another. You ever met somebody like that? Their heart is so full of worship that whenever you talk to them, it just overflows. It comes out of them. You know, I love being around those people. Those are the type of people that, that I love to be around. Whenever you talk to them, their, their whole demeanor reflects Christ. Like, they just bleed Jesus everywhere. Whenever they are talking to you, they are so full of worship that when they talk to you, it just comes out. They are addressing each other. Songs, hymns, spiritual songs. You see? Just, just constantly talking about these things. Constantly worshiping God in word, in deed, in thought, in action here. He says psalms and hymns and spirits. I don't think we should separate these things. Of course he's talking about the psalms from the Old Testament. But also hymns that people write. Spiritual songs. Whether we are under the inspiration or under the, the influence rather of the Holy Spirit here. He says spiritual songs. Songs that people are writing that reflect biblical things. This is the way people talk whenever they are filled with the Spirit. That's the horizontal. What of the vertical? Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. This worship, right? This worship, it flows out of them horizontally because it's projecting forward toward God. They are so filled with worshiping God that it comes out of them in a horizontal fashion. That whenever you talk to them, it's a worship service. Whenever you are speaking in their presence, you are coming to them. They are talking to you. Everything they do is aimed at worshiping God. So much so that it overflows onto everyone around them. I love those people. Most of the time, these are the, the senior saints, right? The silver-headed saints that have walked with Christ their whole life. They've been in the valley. They've been on the mountain. They know what it's like to walk with Jesus in hard times and easy times. And when you talk to them, their whole life is filled with worship. Why? Because their life is being influenced by the Holy Spirit of God that brings glory to God and reflects Christ Jesus. That's why. It's not because they're better than anyone else. It's not because they're less sinful or that they've somehow reached a higher plane. It's not that. It's that they lay out on the Holy Spirit to have influence over them. And what naturally flows out of someone who is filled with the Spirit? Worship. What did Jesus tell the woman of Spirit? I quote it all the time. It seems like every sermon I'm quoting from this passage. What did he tell her? What is the Father seeking? People to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Not only is it a heart filled with worship, but it's a heart that is characterized by thankfulness. Look what he says next. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's not saying that whenever something bad happens to you, you stub your toe and you say, Oh Lord, thank you so much for breaking my big toenail. <laughs> I'm so appreciative of that coffee table that has wrecked my shins. So thankful. It's not what he means. You know what he means. It's a heart that is thankful to God no matter what the circumstances. When you're in the valley, you're thankful that God's presence is there. Whenever you are on the mountaintop, you're thankful for the blessings of God in your life. Whenever you are experiencing hardship, you're thankful for the presence of the Spirit to empower you to take that next step forward. Their whole life, their whole heart is filled with thankfulness, giving thanks to God. And this is what he says, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to God the Father as one who has graciously given us all things. Think about what we've studied in Ephesians so far. He has chosen us. He has loved us. Predestined us for adoption as sons. To be conformed to His Son. To be holy. He has given us salvation. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. He has made us alive with Christ. He has given us a new direction. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He has given us His presence. We have a lot to be thankful for. Someone that is under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they, they're thankful for everything. Even cold weather. I'm so ready for summer. But we've got to be thankful for it, right? But we give thanks to God the Father as the source of all blessings. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the mediation of our Lord. In the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And then he ends by saying submission to one another. 
submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This means that we willingly serve in humility, counting others as more significant than ourselves. Now Paul is going to get into the specifics about this as it plays out in the various life relationships. And we're going to look at that over the next couple of weeks probably. But here he begins with a general heart posture. We submit to one another. We do this out of reverence for Christ. You see that? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, we do this for His glory. Because we belong to Him. Because we have submitted our whole lives to His will and His ways. We submit to one another. And I want to ask you, does this reflect your manner of life? Is this the way you are? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to control your life? Do these characteristics mirror the fruit or the characteristics of your life? Are you someone that when someone talks to them, they say, this person is a worshiper of God. This person is filled with worship. Or when they talk to you, they say, this person is the most thankful person I've ever seen. Or when they talk to you, they say, this person is, is humble and is filled with humility, counting others as more significant than themselves, or submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the way they are. Or do people talk to you and say, that person is a grumbling complainer? I know. No. Listen, this is in all of us. Without the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, this will not be us. Unless we allow the Holy Spirit to have dominion and influence our lives, unless we allow the Holy Spirit's work to dominate our hearts, this won't be us. But God's Word tells us that it can be. If that's not you today, if, if that's not you today, submit yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what naturally comes out. Now, if you're not a Christian here this morning, I do want to say something to you. This is not a fake it till you make it scenario. This is not a pretend and it will be so scenario. You must be born again in order to be filled with the Spirit. All of the effort in the world will never have as, it, have, it, have as its end point God's pleasure. If you go back and read the New Testament, perhaps you're not familiar with the New Testament, you're not a Christian, I want you to go back and read the Gospel accounts. And I want you to ask yourself, who are those that receive the harshest condemnation from Christ? From God. It's those who were trying their best to earn God's favor without accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Those are the ones that receive the harshest condemnation. If you are trying to earn or merit your way into the kingdom of God, you are running as fast as you can in the wrong direction. You will never be saved that way. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you have to turn away from your sins and yourself, and you have to trust in Jesus Christ to save you, based on what He has done for you on the cross. You have to forsake yourself to save you, you have to admit to Him that you can't save yourself, and you have to ask Him to save you based on what He did on the cross. If you are a Christian here this morning, I want to invite you to spend a few moments in honest examination before God. I just want you to take this time. I don't want you to think about what you're going to eat. I don't want you to think about what's coming on or what's happening next. I want you to spend a few moments. I'm going to lead us in a time of response. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. The ladies are going to come up and play. John's going to sing. And if you're a Christian here this morning, I want you to spend this time in honest reflection. Are these things true of me? Am I walking in wisdom? Am I someone that is characterized by godliness? Am I allowing the Holy Spirit to dominate my life? Ask yourself these things. Ask the Lord to examine you. To reveal to you those places in your life where you are holding it back or keeping it from Him. The Bible says so do it. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're kind of confused about what does this mean, what He did for me on the cross? What does it mean to follow Jesus or this Holy Spirit indwelling thing? What does all this mean? I want to invite you to come and talk to me. I would be more than happy to spend a few minutes talking to you about what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Or what is the difference between being saved and being religious? I, I want to talk to you about these things. If you, if you don't understand these things, I want you to come and talk to me. But wherever you are this morning, I want all of us to go before the throne and to lift up our prayers and ourselves to Him. Let's go before the Lord now. 
Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we are sinful people. And Lord, we are people who are still living in this flesh, still living in this world, in this present evil age. Father, we are a people who need to continually look at the manner of our life to make sure that we are walking in wisdom, to make sure that we are walking in your will. Father, we are people who don't need to allow anything in the world to influence us for anything. Father, we are people who need to be filled with your spirit. And so, Father, we pray this morning as we examine our lives, maybe over the past week or over the past month or perhaps over the past year or a few years or decades, or as we look at our lives, Father, as we give honest reflection, God, we pray that you would help us. And Father, we pray as a church body that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would enable us to be people who are characterized by speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts towards you, and giving thanks at all times for everything, for uh, to you and through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us to be a people who are constantly submitting to one another out of reverence for Jesus. Father, we are clay in your hands this morning. We pray that you will mold us and make us, renew us by the transforming of our minds, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.